Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for June 2021. This month we're going to be talking about the planet Jupiter, the constellation of the month which is Boötes, and the very exciting partial solar eclipse which will be happening on the 10th of June. Jupiter is getting better and better place for observing as the month of June goes on. If we go back to the 1st of May, Jupiter wasn't rising until about 4 o'clock in the morning, so not too long before the sun. There wasn't much opportunity to see it before the sun rose. At the, on the 1st of June, you can see that Jupiter is rising around 2 o'clock or just before 2 o'clock. And as the month goes on, Jupiter will rise earlier and earlier, so you'll be able to see it for more and more of the night. If we have a look at it on the 1st of June and just go forward by an hour to 3 in the morning, you can see that Jupiter is quite close to the moon. Um, on the first. So it's quite a nice opportunity to see the two of these together. If we zoom in, in a little bit, you can see that we've got a moon that is a little over half illuminated and we've got the planet Jupiter as well. So a nice photography opportunity there as well if you have a camera. If you do have some observing equipment, if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, then you can take a closer look at the planet Jupiter and see if you can spot the four Galilean moons and I'm going to talk a bit more about those in a moment. Um, if you have a pair of binoculars your ability to spot the moons will probably mostly depend on how steady your hand is because um, if you can hold the binoculars nice and still find something to rest them on you'll have a much easier time picking out those moons um, or if you have a tripod that you can put the binoculars on even, even better. If you have a small telescope then you could be trying to pick out some of this um, detail on the surface surface of Jupiter, so um, particularly looking for the north and south equatorial cloud belts, these dark stripes on the surface. Even with a small telescope, you should be able to pick those out. Just going to zoom us out now and take us to the morning of the 5th of June at around half past one. I'm staying with Jupiter. You will need a telescope for this. You can see that at half past one in the morning on the 5th, Jupiter is just beginning to peak above the horizon. So go outside and look for your south, southeastern horizon and just wait until Jupiter pops above the horizon for you. Then train your small telescope on the planet and you'll see that something is happening on the surface over here. And what you're seeing is a shadow transit of the large moons Io and Ganymede, their shadows are transiting across the surface of the planet and we've actually got the, both the shadows coinciding with each other as Jupiter rises on the morning of the 5th. And if we start moving time along, you can see that transit as it happens. So you can follow it for a couple of hours and you can see how Io's shadow moving faster than Ganymede's shadow starts to appear to speed away um, from Ganymede's shadow and if we keep going you will lose Io just after half past two or Io's shadow just after half past two and then Ganymede's shadow just around quarter past three. So that is a nice little event to have a look at with your small telescope if you have one um, and Jupiter will get higher as that event goes on so it will, it will get easier to observe um, rather than right at the beginning at half past one when Jupiter's only just coming above the horizon. Um, you might notice as well that in the same region of sky we also have Saturn. So while you're out observing Jupiter, take a look, see if you can spot Saturn as well. If you have a small telescope, you can train that on Saturn and take a look and see if you can spot Saturn's rings and also Saturn's large moon Titan should be within reach of a small telescope as well. Let's go and take a look at the eclipse now. So I'm going to go to the morning of the 10th of June at around 10 o'clock. And the first thing to say when observing an eclipse is that you need to make sure you're taking care of your eyesight. So it's really, really important that you don't try to observe the eclipse directly, either with your naked eye or with any piece of optical equipment, such as a telescope or a pair of binoculars. 
because if you do that, you could permanently damage your eyesight or even cause blindness. So it's really, really important that when you're observing the eclipse that you do it safely and that if you're unsure, you do seek some advice from somebody who can advise you um, how to observe the eclipse safely. Let's take a look at what is going to happen over the course of the eclipse and then we'll talk a little bit about how to observe the eclipse safely. So you can see here, if we zoom in a little bit, we are 10 o'clock in the morning, you can just about make out the moon moving closer to the sun and it's going to start to obscure the sun's surface. How much of an eclipse you see will depend on where you are in the country. So for us in the UK, this is a partial eclipse. If you are further north, you're going to see a bigger eclipse than you would in the south. If you are down in Cornwall, you will see about 22% of the sun's disk will be covered. If you are up in Scotland, you'll see about 35%. You can see that my location here is set as Leicester, home of the National Space Centre, and your eclipse will begin at around 5 past 10. And again, that depends exactly where you are in the country when you're going to get first contact. So you want to get out there nice and early, a bit before 10 o'clock. If you're using equipment, get that all set up, make sure it's all working properly um, so that you're nice and ready just after 10 o'clock for the beginning of the eclipse. So I am going to start moving time on and you can see just after 10 o'clock, the moon is appearing to take that first bite out of the sun. You can see on our sun installarium here, we've got some features on the surface. We've got some sunspots visible. If you have equipment to observe the sun, you may be able to see some of those. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And you can see as the eclipse progresses, more and more of the sun's surface is obscured by the moon until... The moon begins to move away again and as we get approach uh, midday and past midday you can see that the moon will leave again um, around about half past 12 depending on whereabouts you are in the country. So for us in the UK, this is a partial solar eclipse. Usually when you see a partial solar eclipse, that means that somewhere in the world, somebody is experiencing a total solar eclipse. For this eclipse, that isn't the case. Elsewhere in the world, some people will be experiencing what's known as an annular solar eclipse rather than a total solar eclipse. During a total solar eclipse, the moon covers the whole of the sun's surface and for a couple of minutes you get to see the solar corona sometimes known as the sun's atmosphere uh, producing this dramatic um, light around the sun during an annular eclipse the moon still doesn't completely cover the sun's surface and the reason that that happens is because the moon's orbit isn't circular so it doesn't always appear the same size to us and during this particular eclipse the moon is just a couple of days past its furthest point in its orbit meaning it appears slightly smaller than it does at other times because it appears slightly smaller it means it doesn't completely cover the sun's surface and we get what's known as an annular eclipse sometimes known as a ring of fire eclipse because you can still see a, a ring of the sun surrounding the moon um, and I'll show you what that looks like by taking us to a location where the eclipse is going to be annular um, so the eclipse will be an annular eclipse um, in parts of Canada parts of Greenland Siberia and at the North Pole um, so if I take us to one of those locations so we're in the far north now and if I go to let's try 11 o'clock so here we are the beginning of the eclipse somewhere around the North Pole and if I let the eclipse happen you can already see that much more of the Sun's surface is getting covered by the moon than it is in the UK and if I go to the center point of the eclipse you can see that the moon is covering the sun and we have this ring of fire effect around the outside known as an annular eclipse and then as it did for us the moon will eventually move off uncovering the sun again for us to see so let's go back to our location which is leicester home of the national space center and let's go back into the eclipse. 
So the question now is how to observe the eclipse safely. And there are a few ways to do that. One way is to buy a pair of eclipse glasses, which are like a pair of cardboard glasses that you put over your eyes and they've got a piece of solar film, solar filter in there to filter out the vast majority of the light coming from the sun before it reaches your eye to make it safe for you to observe. Um, if you want to buy a pair of those, make sure you buy them from somebody that's reputable and make sure you check them over for any damage before you use them. Another thing that you can do just with things that you have at home is to make yourself a little pinhole projector. So you can get yourself a piece of white card, make a hole in that white card with a pin or a needle, place a second piece of white card on the ground. And then if you stand with your card that's got the hole in it, um, stand with the sun behind you, hold your pinhole card above your shoulder and aim the projected image onto the card that you've got on the ground. And you should see an image of the eclipse on your screen that you've placed on the ground. Um, if you can place that screen in a shadow, in a shadowy area, that will help. Um, and you can make your image larger and smaller by moving closer and further away from the screen. Um, and there are lots of versions of this pinhole method. If you have a look online, there'll be um, ways to make it a pinhole projector in a box or ways where you use a square of foil and make the pinhole in that. They're all essentially the same thing. Depends on how, on how crafty you are. Um, but the very simplest way to do it is a pinhole in one piece of card and project your image onto another piece of card, remembering to have your back to the sun and to not be looking directly at the sun at any point during that activity. Another thing you can try if you're not crafty at all and you don't even fancy making a pinhole um, projector, you can go into your kitchen, pick up a colander from the cupboard, take it outside um, and do the same thing. Stand with your back to the sun, hold up the colander um, and have a piece of white card on the ground or in your hand and see if you can project multiple images of the sun through the holes of your colander onto your card um, and it looks quite artistic when you do that. It's quite fun and you should be able to see the sun's disc with a little uh, piece punched out of it um, by the moon. Um, so quite a fun and easy way to observe the eclipse if you've not got much time or you don't fancy making anything. If you do have a telescope or a pair of binoculars, there are a couple of ways that you can use them to safely observe the sun. We know that we must never look through our binoculars or telescope directly at the sun because it can damage our vision. But you can use a solar filter which fits on the front of your telescope. You can buy those from any reputable telescope supplier. You can get glass ones that screw on the front of your telescope. You can also buy solar film which you can then cut to size and use on the front of your telescope. You can also use solar film on the front of your binoculars as well. Um, if you're buying solar film, again, make sure you buy it from a reputable supplier. Make sure it's not damaged when you use it. Make sure the filters that you make are secure um, and you can find tutorials online to enable you to do that. If you use a white light filter or solar film, which also is a white light filter, then you may be able to see more details on the sun than you would be able to do with projection alone. So you might be able to pick out some sunspots. Um, you can see some sunspots on my image here. Sunspots are regions on the sun where the magnetic field lines are concentrated and that causes a colder spots on the surface of the sun. Um, you might see Active regions showing up as little bright patches known as faculae, um, which is Latin for little torch. Um, and you can look near the edges of the sun, to see if you can spot those bright patches. You might also be able to spot the granulation of the sun's surface. Um, so the surface of the sun literally appears grainy, and that's because of convection currents transferring heat to the surface. Um, the granulation can be tricky to see. You need to have good seeing conditions to be able to spot it. Um, so there's some of the things that you might be able to see if you have a solar filter for your telescope. The other way that you may be able to use your telescope or pair of binoculars to observe the eclipse is to use them as a projector. 
Uh, so projection using telescopes has been used for centuries, all the way back to the time of Galileo. And similarly to when you use a pinhole projector, you use your telescope as a projector and project the image onto a piece of card. There are tutorials online showing you how to do this. It's important to do it safely. If you're not sure, then make sure you follow a reputable tutorial or get somebody to work with you who knows how to do it. You don't want to have your equipment overheating. You shouldn't use a reflecting telescope for this because reflecting telescopes are more likely to overheat and become damaged. Um, and you need to make sure that nobody can look into um, the telescope. So don't leave it unattended. Make sure everybody knows that they shouldn't be looking directly into the telescope or into the beam. Um, it's a good idea to take finder scopes and things off as well, just to minimise the risk. Um, but you can use your telescope or pair of binoculars to make a projector. Um, you'll get a nice image on your piece of card and you'll get a larger, clearer image than you would get just using a pinhole projector alone. And whichever way you choose to observe the eclipse, whether that's eclipse glasses, if it's pinhole projection, if it's telescope projection or using a solar filter, Make sure that you do it safely, enjoy the eclipse, and hopefully we'll, we'll all have really good weather on the morning of the 10th because it's very disappointing when you go out there and you're all ready for the eclipse and suddenly the weather is bad. Um, but even if it's a bit cloudy, hopefully there'll be some breaks in the cloud and we'll all be able to catch a glimpse. Let's go back into the night sky now and look at our constellation of the month, which is Boötes, the herdsman. So I'm just going to go into the evening. We'll stay on the 10th. And let's put the constellation labels back on. So springtime is a good time to um, be looking for uh, Boötes. And let's just swing around and put the constellation art on so that we can see how Boötes is depicted in the night sky. So Boötes is the herdsman. Um, he can be seen in some depictions driving the plough or the Big Dipper around the night sky, rotating around the North Star. Um, Boötes contains one of the brightest stars in the night sky, so it's quite an easy one to find. It contains the red giant Arcturus. Um, you can use the familiar shape of the plough to help you find that. So here we have the plough or the Big Dipper and you can follow the arc, follow the handle to Arcturus. And Arcturus is a red giant star, as I said, in the final stages of its life. It's run out of hydrogen fuel to fuse into helium and swelled to a huge size and will eventually lose its outer layers, leaving behind a tiny white dwarf star. And this is the exact same fate that we can expect for our own sun in about five billion years time. Um, so you can look at Arcturus and imagine our sun in the future. That brings me to the end of our What's in the Night Sky session for June 2021. And I'll be back next month to talk about what you can see in July.